الذين ينضموا للاستماع الى راديو بلدي او الراديو العربي الامريكي ويعنى بقضايا الحرب في المهجر. برامجنا في راديو بلدي كل يوم جمعه من الثامنه وحتى التاسعه صباحا مع ليلى الحسيني في بث حي ومباشر وعبر دبليو ان بي كي راديو 690 اي ام صباح الخير بلدي صباح الخير لكل مستمعينا. Welcome to Radio Baladi, the first Arab, Middle Eastern and American simulcast radio show. Radio Baladi is broadcast every Friday morning on WNZK 690 AM from 8 until 9 Eastern Time on Good Morning Michigan with Layla Al Husseini. Our call-in number 248-557-3300. And now, stay tuned for the best radio talk show on Arab and American issues with your host, Layla Al Husseini. <laughs> I am Atif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Good morning. Why the Araf is running for Congress? We'll ask her why she is running, among other questions. She's a Palestinian American human rights activist in Michigan. We tried to reach uh, out to another candidate for Congress in New York, Rana Abdelhamid, but we did not hear back from her. She is another female running for Congress. So the question is why we are having more women than men running for Congress. We also have with us today two more guests who We'll discuss the challenges faced by Arab American candidates. Adil Muzrib, uh, who may be stuck in a snowstorm uh, at the airport in Michigan. Um, he sits on uh, the Board of Education in Dearborn. And Zainab uh, Farhas, who deals with, um, perhaps on a daily basis, with issues of Islamophobia and Arab phobia, phobia as a director with CARE, Council on uh, um, American Islamic Relationship. Before we get started, um, here is a program note. We are coming to you not just on radio, but also on video. Go to the page, Facebook page of US Arab Radio, and you can watch us on Zoom. Again, US Arab Radio on Facebook. Also, because of the huge snowstorm uh, that is sweeping much of the US right now, we may encounter some technical problems. But let me begin by asking uh, Hawaii Daraf, why are you running for Congress? Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Altif. Good morning to all your listeners. Now, I am the daughter of working class immigrants, and now I'm a mom of two young kids myself. So I know the daily challenges facing working people. Good jobs, living wages, or rising prices, uh, housing insecurity, health care. My parents came to this country to give me and my siblings a chance at freedom and opportunity. And I'm grateful that my father found a union job. He worked so hard and my parents were able to provide that for us. We didn't have a whole lot growing up, but I know that we weren't in want of anything. And importantly, I know I believed growing up that the sky was the limit. I could be whatever I wanted. And I don't see that same opportunity available for our children today. People are working as hard as ever and they can't make ends meet. I'm running for Congress because I'm frankly tired of seeing the rich getting richer while we're told that there isn't enough money to invest and uplift the rest of us. 
I'm running because Michigan families want and deserve good, well-paying jobs, quality schools, uh, safe neighborhoods, resilient infrastructure, and we want healthy communities. And I want to be the voice of the people in Washington. I have fought for human rights for most of my adult life. I did a lot of work in Palestine on the ground in the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, when I saw just flagrant human rights abuses before me, I see human rights abuses around me now in Macomb, Michigan. It's not the same that I saw in Palestine, but people are being abused and people are being denied. And that's because our policies do not center people and they do not center human rights. And I, I think it's enough. I want to be a, a voice of that, a conscious that we must put people at the center of our policies, uh, whether foreign policy or domestic policy. Uh, that is why I'm running. Okay, I will have uh, more questions for you later on, but uh, let me go uh, with a question uh, to um, Adel Muzip, uh, because he is uh, stuck at the airport now and might have to leave us uh, because of the snowstorm. Adel, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Doc. Uh, okay, uh, okay. You have your own experience uh, with election uh, as an Arab American. Uh, you are right now on the Board of Education uh, in Dearborn. Um, but um, so the, the second time around, you won the election. But Actually, tell us about you. Uh, okay, so tell us about your experience, how you yeah, lost so, and how you won. Absolutely. So, um, first of all, my name is Adel Moza. Uh, I sit now on the Board of Education of Dearborn Schools and also Henry Ford College. And I do software development for a living. Currently, I work for a startup uh, or a subsidiary of a staffing company where we teach uh, trainees uh, programming. And uh, it's kind of essentially boot camps to get them to get to uh, tech jobs and, and Fortune 500 companies. And uh, I'm fortunate to be in this country. I came in as an immigrant, as a 13 year old, joined father worked for the motor company since 77. And uh, I, I'm kind of the poster child of a childhood or of a, an immigrant child who comes to the U.S. at a, at a young age and uh, to, to realize the opportunities while also knowing how little the opportunities were in my home country in Yemen, the country that is currently obviously destroyed, unfortunately. But um, I have high hopes that it, it will come back and, uh, as the uh, Arabian feelings. Um, so I came to the U.S. at age 13, and I managed to get a high school diploma from Portson High School, for tractors. And then I went to U of M Dearborn for, Blue for my bachelor's and then uh, MBA from Wayne State University. And when I graduated, Doc, from uh, University of Michigan in Dearborn, I looked at my Fortson yearbook, and I saw many of my colleagues uh, working just, uh, you know, still blue uh, kind of blue collar jobs, uh, jobs that only pay you barely the minimum wage. And they don't realize that this is the land of opportunities where you can get solid education and you can actually, you know, uh, change the world if you get the right education in, in it and, and, and get the right resources in order to be an entrepreneur in order to be a business owner or to work for a job that is, it gives you dignity, gives you vacation times, you're able to travel and live a quality of life that is dignified. So going back, I'm like, I have to do something for my classmates. And for those who are going through the same experience, you saw kids who do not finish their education, kids that would drop out of school, um, girls that would marry early and, and, and forget about their aspirations of, of getting a, a higher degree. So I started a nonprofit organization chapter for the American Association of Yemeni Students and Professionals. And we started organizing in, in Michigan and uh, starting in our own schools, the West schools that we went to Ports in Salina um, at Silford. And then we started, I started getting involved. And then as I got involved, I realized that decisions are being made above the principal. Decisions are being made with a superintendent and there is something called the school board. I'm like, okay, what does the school board mean? They said, like, you have to get elected by the people in order to oversee the school district. 
you know, and, and obviously doing my research. And then there are public meetings where you can actually attend. So I started attending those meetings and voicing my concerns. Hey, guys, we could do this different. I've seen it where it could be done easily or something different. So not to take so much time, it's like, I was like, I want to run for this board. I want to be part of this decision-making process. And when I did that, I applied first in 2015 when there was a vacancy. I didn't get in. I wasn't even considered. It was like my application was just tossed. Although I have an MBA teaching experience and five years of working experience as a software developer. Um, 2016, I decided to run. I put in a campaign and I challenged two incumbents. Um, who were Arab Americans as well, Lebanese Americans to be exactly. And uh, they are now great colleagues of mine. But before that, I, they, fa- uh, they felt threatened that a Yemeni American is running in Dearborn. And we have to realize also the classism that unfortunately in the Arab world we do have, that Lebanese Americans feel like they're entitled to a lot of things. Now some are unfortunately. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so. Okay, I understand. Yeah. You are at the airport uh, so, now. Absolutely. And, and I'm actually the, on the plane right now, and we're about to board. Or actually, the car. I I know that you uh, may have to leave us. At so I ran in 2016. Yeah, quickly. I ran in 2016. I lost, and then there was a 2017 vacancy. I was not appointed. They chose somebody else because of the connections. 2018, I ran again and I lost. And then 2019, I finally got appointed. And 2020, I got first place in the elections. And now I'm on the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. What you you are? I was saying that you are at the airport now, uh, and and you have a snowstorm. So what does I'm already storm on look the, like? I'm already on the flight. So I'm sorry. You are already they're, on. They're the asking plane. me to leave. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. I'll, I'll Thank you. You're, okay, you are in control of your technology. Uh, okay, that's good. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you as as uh, as long as you are you're still available. Um, uh, um, Zainab, uh, you deal with uh, issues of Islamophobia, Arabophobia on a daily basis. But what is the most common form of uh, of Islamophobia that you come across? Uh, That's a good question, doctor, and good morning, everyone. Glad to be on with all of you. Um, I think it depends on who you ask. Islamophobia um, can reach us in so many different areas of our lives that I think it just depends on on how we receive it. So we have state-sanctioned Islamophobia, which can look like a Muslim registry, uh, the Muslim ban, unwarranted surveillance on Muslim communities, We saw this a lot, not only here in Dearborn, but in New York City, Um, courts or jails banning women in hijab from entering. Um, And then we also have the Islamophobia, maybe that's more common to people or that we can um, we can see from explicit bias. So harassment of women in hijabs or uh, we see a lot of school issues, bullying from not only students, but staff members. Um, We see policy and curriculum issues within our schools whether um, curriculum is not uh, not checked and is using inaccurate information or Islamophobic information, uh, policy that doesn't allow students um, to go and pray or to receive proper accommodations while they're at school, um, which is something that they do have the right to do at a public school. So um, the list goes on and on in terms of what Islamophobia looks like, but I think it looks like something different for every person, um, and especially those entering the political arena. Um, but uh, Islamophobia can come to us in, in many different ways. Uh, mask vandalism, again, I can go on and on. Um, it just depends on how it touches you individually. Okay, we are going to take a brief break. When I come back, I want to ask you, all of you, uh, the, the most important question today, which is why we have more women running for Congress or for elected office than men. After the break. While we've been staying safe at home, scientists have been on a journey. The destination, a COVID-19 vaccine. This journey began decades ago with research into other coronaviruses. Scientists built from there with months of research and development. 
cooperation with other experts worldwide, and clinical trials on tens of thousands of volunteers of diverse race, age, and health status. They arrived at a safe, effective vaccine, and hundreds of thousands in Michigan have already been vaccinated. But the next step is ours. We need to get the vaccine when we can, keep wearing masks correctly and taking precautions until we reach our destination, freedom from COVID-19 and getting back to the lives we love. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Ziad brand, quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. When it comes to reproductive medicine, IVF Michigan Fertility Centers are the recognized leaders. With locations in Bloomfield Hills and five other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. As a founding member of IVF Michigan Fertility Centers, Dr. Nicholas Shama is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. Dr. Shama has performed over 10,000 IVF cases and has helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. American board certified in both obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility, Dr. Nicholas Shama is a very caring, compassionate, expert physician that understands not only the medical but also the emotional toil of infertility on his patients. When it's time, get personalized care from Dr. Nicholas Shama at IVF Michigan Fertility Centers in Michigan and Ohio. Call toll-free 855-952-9600, 855-952-9600. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali Abagdadi and Fatty Bonham serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali Abagdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all CDC guidelines and is open every day, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. I am Atif Abdel Jala. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are talking about Arab American women running for Congress. And the question I have for everybody now, all my three guests, and I will start with uh, Mrs. Araf, Fouad Araf. Um, why, why is it that we have more women, uh, unless I'm mistaken, why we have more women, Arab American women running uh, for Congress, more women than men? That is a very good question. First, let me also say what an honor it is to be on with the guests. I think I forgot to say hello to my fellow guests this morning. Uh, really is an honor to be on with you. And also just briefly, I want to touch on something that Abdif said. I really commend him for his work. And, and he decided to run for office at a local level, which is also so important. There are all kinds of levels to run for. It's generally seen. It's Adel. Um, Adel. Oh, Adel, I, I apologize. No, no, it's okay. Uh, uh, we, we often look at some of the higher offices, but it's really important to get people, uh, women and uh, 
everybody, all kind of good people that want to do good for the people to run for all levels of office and especially look at the local offices. Now, as for your question, I, I think that's a great a trend or something to see because historically women have not run for political office as much. We usually see the field dominated by men. Uh, over the last few years, there have been there has been a little bit of a, a surge of women running, and I think that that is owed to a number of different factors, and uh, including support groups that have popped up to help women run for office because women have historically been disadvantaged in in all kinds of ways. Uh, we've seen it as not necessarily something we can go after. But now, again, there are wonderful groups there to help women, especially starting off early. One of the big things that candidates for office have to do, especially uh, higher elected offices, is raise a lot of money. And on top of the campaigning, uh, you're expected to spend hours and hours a day just calling people and raising money because, unfortunately, in our political system today, uh, the viability of a candidate is judged by how much money he or she raises. And that's not easy, especially for women when you're piling that on top of all of the other burdens that generally women feel that they have to take on. Now, getting specifically <clears throat> to, the, to Arab Americans, I can't say that I, I know or have studied it too much. I know that I am happy to see uh, fellow women and Arab American women running for office. I, you know, as you know, Arabs and Muslims in America, we know, and Zainab talked about the the pressures, the stresses, the Islamophobia uh, being painted a certain way, and I think that that has historically discouraged us from running for office. I know that that is something I really thought about before running. For months, I was considering what is going to be the effect on my kids. I know the uh, ugly. Uh, lies are going to start to fly as they do with the negative campaigning always. Uh, my people who are in politics locally told me that I might have to consider security detail because of even just how polarized uh, the politics has become. And specifically as someone who has worked on Palestinian human rights, we are uh, attacked and vilified, and that is only going to increase what kind of impact is this going to have on the people around me, on my elderly parents, on my children, having to see this because I don't think I'm going to be able to shield them from the ugliness of the attacks that come. I know that I'm determined to run a very positive campaign and try as much as possible to steer away from that, but I know that it's going to come, and it took me honestly months to decide that. As difficult as, as this might be, it is the right thing right. to do because more than anything, I want to show my kids, other women, <clears throat> Arab women, that we can take our energy and our skills and our love to places of, of power and, and policymaking. If I may. Uh, okay, uh, yes, I do. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, I, I, I think, I think all, the all, perception I, let, that... Let me just say... Can you hear me, me or not? Let, I can hear you, but let me okay. just tell you that you provide us with a unique experience. You are our Absolutely. flying guest. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you so much. I, I truly appreciate it. Um, I don't see the audio, so please tell me that I, you're still hearing me. Okay, you are still here. Okay, great. So uh, I think the notion that you're putting, Doc, is somewhat... Uh, I don't want to say uh, misguided, but uh, rather than probably because we're seeing a trend now of more Arab Americans running and we see more of them as women, that we think, oh, more, more women are actually in office. If we currently look at the state house of representatives, the majority are still white, old men. So um, okay, I agree. There's, yeah. What was that? Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I am yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's not to consider. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's not to even consider uh, the Senate. The Senate is even more uh, undiversified. Uh, so because we're seeing this trend doesn't really mean change the reality. The reality is that, uh, you know, public offices, whether they're school boards, city councils, or even at the state house or the state Senate or even in Congress, we're still uh, miles away from having true reflection of the uh, population. There are so many different still underprivileged, underrepresented segments of the population that need to be diversified that you it's so crucial to have people who really understand the issues at their core level and i when i mean diversity i don't just mean ethnically 
I mean, diversity in thought, diversity in, in trainings, diversity in perspectives, in, in, in roles and jobs. Uh, and when we have a diversified council, for example, city council, that you have an attorney, um, you have somebody who does, uh, you know, technology, uh, somebody who's in medicine, then you definitely uh, will have a, a good council, a council that will be true representative also of the population that you have. If you have a city that is, for example, Arab American, 50%, then you want to see some Arab Americans. If there are Hispanic Americans in that district, you want to see some Hispanic Americans being represented. Everybody wins when there is true representation uh, in, in city government or in state government or in Ultimately, the federal government. Um, when we saw, yeah, when we saw Barack Obama getting elected as the first Black American to be elected to the to the highest office in the nation, it was a surreal moment for all of us because we say, "Has justice been achieved?" What Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and the icons of the civil rights actually foresaw, and they were dreaming of that day. And I wish they stayed with us until then until this moment and celebrated with us the, the election of, of President Obama, um, as surreal as it was. And, and, and now we're, we're we, the first country in the world or the first most advanced country in the world still doesn't have a woman president yet. Um, it, it is, I'm not gonna say it's a shame, but it, it, I think we're getting there and we're getting there slowly. Uh, to 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 close, uh, Doctor, um, your your question about the women being represented, they're still way, women are still way underrepresented, whether in jobs in higher offices. So the trend right now, yeah, we have more women, but I think that is a good trend to correct the current uh, inequity in women representation, and as well as ethnic women or uh, brown women who are, who, who are running now for office. I commend uh, Ms. Arath for having that courage. It takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of um, uh, kind of courage to actually run for office. Um, I was attacked. I was vilified. My family was, you know, when you run for public office, you're putting yourself for scrutiny. It's not an easy thing. It's not a nice gig. People so think, oh, like you know. Oh, we're getting delayed. So that's a good thing that I could stay with you guys. So um, I, I, all I'm saying is that, you know, some people think you know, when you get in office, oh, you're that famous person. Actually, you know, being famous is not really <laughs> fun. <laughs> when, when my wife when I and I, we go to a restaurant and I know everybody there, she gets really bothered by it. So... <laughs> It's, it's not all uh, rosy pictures and, and things like that. And it, losses, a loss, and especially a loss after a loss. People in Dearborn were saying, when is this guy going to give up and, and just quit? You know, why are you still running for school board? Why don't you run for city council where you actually have a higher chance of making it? And I, my response was like, my heart is in education. I truly want to be on the school board so I can change those policies so I can advocate for equity so I can advocate for the right things so we can achieve quality education in, in our district. Thank you, Doc. Okay, same question uh, goes to uh, Zainab, uh, Zainab Fahas. Uh, why um, do we seem to have more women than men running for Congress? I would echo what the panelists have said. That Well, I personally have not seen statistics of this, but what I will say I think instead of focusing on if we're seeing more females running, I think the question is, are we finally giving them the support and attention that they need? Um, because I think females have been running for public office for quite a long time now. Um, and if we take a step back, I think we're seeing um, groups who have not largely been represented in U.S. government step forward. So that does include, like we heard, females, Arab Muslims. Um, I mean, here in Southeast Michigan, we saw Representative Abdullah Hamoud turn into mayor of the city of Dearborn, Abdullah Hamoud. Now we have Bilal Hamoud, who is not related, uh, looking to take uh, that representative seat in Michigan's 15th uh, district seat in the House. So uh, city of Hamtramck, 
a bunch of Muslim men coming forward as representative, uh, mayor, city council. So And women, by the way, Ms. Fast, there's a, a Muslim woman on city in Hamtramck City Council. Now, she is Polish. She's a river, but uh, Polish, Muslim, American on city council, as best that it gets. So uh, true representation there in Hamtramck, and we're really um, pleased to see that representation come through because for a very long time, you had only one Yemeni American on city council in a city, and I'm sorry for taking more of your time, but in a city that is uh, highly, uh, Yemeni Americans make up 50%. You only had one uh, city council member, which was Dr. Abdul Al-Ghazali, who has passed away, may God rest his soul. But it was, it was truly inequity, truly underrepresented. And now you have two... Um, uh, Yemeni Americans, you have two Bengali Americans, you have uh, two Polish Americans, and uh, one African American, uh, I think, on the school board, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, city, uh, city of Hamtramck truly now has true representation and true diversified council and school boards, which is a good thing. It's a healthy way uh, to do that. So, thank you. Okay, Zainab, go ahead, pick up your answer. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, my point was just that I think we're seeing uh, more people come forward. And I, I think that's based on inspiration. We're asking why are we seeing women come forward? But I think groups that have not largely been represented in U.S. government, in the political arena, are, are feeling encouraged more than ever. Because representation to me when I was a little girl was seeing a Muslim woman in hijab walk in my local grocery store. And I thought, wow, there's other Muslims here in a non-dominant, you know, Muslim city. And then I see Muslim women as I grow up on TV or in ads in stores. And now, you know, Muslim women in Congress or in public offices. So I think the encouragement or the why just comes from inspiration and wanting to fill that representation money, gap. Money, money, money. Um, and I think we definitely need to look at local, uh, more on the local level too, and encourage um, those from our community to push towards uh, running for local public offices so that we can see who's on school boards, who's making sure that curriculum looks okay, who's on zoning boards. Um, actually, CARE Michigan is in lawsuit with the city of Troy because their zoning board uh, denied the Muslims their first Islamic house of worship in the city of Troy. Um, and we came to discover that zoning board uh, members were actually given playbooks uh, or handbooks on how to utilize zoning laws to keep Muslims out so that they don't build masajid inside cities like uh, Troy. So um, we're seeing Islamophobia embed itself in our public lives. And I think um, that should be encouraging um, to those who are looking to join the public arena to start local, because I think that's where a lot of the impact happens. Uh, and we see, unfortunately, a lot of people struggling for that representation. Okay, we're going to take a break, quick break uh, right now. But when we come back, I have a question for Huayda. Uh, and that is, uh, we have currently we have about two Arab American uh, representatives uh, in the U.S. Congress. Do you have a role model to uh, talk about when we come back from the break? What's my ETA? Your estimated time of arrival is 9.17. I'm late. I'll have to punch it. Speeding will save you just one minute and 36 seconds. It will also increase your risk of a crash, as well as the odds that you will be stopped and issued an expensive speeding ticket. Yeah, but... In one year, there were 22,000 speeding-related crashes in Michigan, resulting in 200 deaths. If I had someone in the car with me, I'd drive slower. But it's just me. This is not a logical response. No, you have no passenger. Surrounding cars contain 27 others, including five children and one Labrador retriever. <laughs> How do you know all this stuff? I know everything, Kevin. The risk of a crash increases with every mile you drive over the speed limit. So slow down. Speed enforcement is happening now. A message from the Michigan Office of Highway Safety Planning. 
اثنين ثلاثة أربعة خمسة ستة سبعة Shots Mediterranean Market in Shish Kebab offers a great array of your favorite Mediterranean meals. Meals range from lamb specialties, shawarma sandwiches, and seafood dinners. Plus, they offer big trays of your favorite food and so much more. Kashat's Mediterranean Market and Shish Kebab is located at 32839 Northwestern Highway in Farmington Hills and is open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So stop in or call Kashat's today at 248-538-9552. That number again, 248-538-9552. Kashat's Mediterranean Market and Shish Kebab will definitely leave you satisfied. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. Enjoy the first Syrian-style cuisine in Michigan. At Damas Cuisine and Catering, you'll find a wide selection of Syrian foods and sweets in our menu, like free cake, hoisi, grape leaves with steak, mashawi platter, hot mahashi, char-grilled kebang, shawarma, and much more. Get super-fast delivery from Damas Cuisine and Catering right to your door. Order online at damascuisine.com forward slash menu and track your order live. Damas Cuisine and Catering, 28841 Orchard Lake Road in Farmington Hills. Call 248-987-4985. I am Atif Abdel Jalal. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are discussing the issue of Arab American women running for Congress and uh, Hawaii. Currently, we have two. Arab American representatives in Congress, Elhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Uh, do you have any role model among the, those groups? You know, I'm frequently asked if there is a member of Congress that I would like to model myself or that I admire. And I, I say that there are many, actually. I really respect the uh, roles that. Uh, Congresswoman Tlaib and uh, Omar have uh, stepped into and they have faced brutal attack and they withstood those attacks and that has been really important. But it, it's broader in terms of what I respect from different members of uh, not only of Congress, but of different representatives, what I respect the most and want to make sure that I uh, as much as possible can also be, is a tireless advocate for the voice of the people. Traditionally, we see in elected office just the power of uh, corporate interests taking over. And that goes back to something I said about how much money someone has to raise to run for public office. It uh, And what ends up happening is that these uh, corporations and, and lobbyists and dump a lot of money into candidates. And then they, you see members of Congress then uh, voting or legislating a certain way that does not keep the interests of the people in mind. Congresswoman Tlaib and Congresswoman Omar were two of the just handful of members of Congress that refused to take corporate PAC money. And then, so they are accountable to the people and not to these special interests. And I 
I definitely am doing the same there, always being accountable to the people uh, that I, and advocating tirelessly for the people. When I first got in, a, a sitting member of Congress tried to compare me and tried to say, oh, she just wants to be another member of the squad or modeling herself after Bernie Sanders. And I said, you know, not really, but I am honored to be compared to the members of, of our legislature, of our Congress and Senate that stand out as being tireless advocates for the people. That And it just one thing that is, I think, so important that goes to what uh, Zainab and what Adil have spoken to in terms of representation and getting to the level of representation that we want to see uh, uh, legislating at all levels. We also not, not only have to run for office, but we have to mobilize various communities and our uh, ethnic communities or, or those that we identify with in terms of thought and other things to vote and to get involved. We would have a, a, a better chance or we make that many more strides towards getting the representation that we wanted if we also do the groundwork to make sure that we're educating our communities and more than important than anything, we are registering people and facilitating so that people can vote. Adil, Madhub, you are still with us. Uh, and and yes. I, have, I have a tough question, uh, a double question for you. One is that I know you are not running for Congress, but are you planning to run for Congress? No, no, point? no, no. But then Absolutely. the second question is, yeah. wait a second. And the second question is, what is your foreign policy agenda? Which a question that I'm going to ask Huayda as well in a minute. <laughs> foreign policy on a school board? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, here's the thing. A lot of people have asked me to run for state house. And I said, I've only been on the school board for two and a half years. I would do a disservice to my constituents who have elected me to a six-year term if I run for another office that early. I do well in my private life working as a software developer and as a trainer. Um, and I, I, make, I would make much more you know, of a living than, than working in, uh, for the U.S. government as an elected official. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is uh, while I truly admire the people and, and who have the courage to run for higher offices, I do not have the capacity to do that at this current time. Now, this may change in the future when my kids are grown and I probably I'll be more bored. <laughs> uh, but definitely, you know, being on the school board right now, I want to be a reflective, uh, dedicate my time to making sure that I do uh, make a difference on my school board and uh, finish my term. And uh, if, if there is an opportunity in the future, God knows what happens in the future, and that might be an option. As far as my foreign policy, I'm very active also in, in the space of, of the humanitarian aid for Yemen. And hopefully, you know, we can see a political solution to the conflict there of, of, of the war and the destruction that Yemen has been dubbed as the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. And I, the media, does, unfortunately, does not highlight the impact that Yemeni Americans and Yemenis especially are going through right now. They're being bombarded by, uh, their country was taken by a militia, and now we have more militias, and, and now we have the Saudis also aggression uh, of, of taking a war and, and, and not ending this war. We thought this was gonna be you know, a two month thing, uh, ending the coup, but it's, it's turning more than that. It's turning to be a playground for international uh, players. Unfortunately, they're, they're, they're doing their games in, in Yemen. They're, 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 unfortunately, I would say this with very honesty, they're using Yemenis as pawns for their war. And when I say that, I say Iran and Saudi Arabia, of course, is the main player there. But uh, Yemen, Yemen, unfortunately, has been the playground for, for these uh, you know, regional powers to play wars. And obviously, they've used Iraq and they've used Libya, and they tried to use Egypt. And I'm, I'm glad that Egypt refused that to, the outside intervention. And Yemenis, if they sit down together, they can definitely um, uh, sort things out without outside intervention. Hawaida, I'm going to ask you about your foreign policy agenda in a minute, but let me first ask Zainab um, one critical question, and that is. Um, what 
uh, do you advise victims of Islamophobia, Arab phobia? What should they do? What is the best way to deal with uh, uh, Islamophobia? Well, depending on how I think it, uh, it comes to them, one, I would say record the information written or by video and try to contact CARE Michigan immediately. Uh, CARE Michigan is a civil rights group, so we work with clients who face discrimination, whether it has to do with nation of origin, uh, ethnicity, uh, religion, etc. cetera. Um, but I would say contact our office as soon as possible so that we can assist you. Uh, because again, Islamophobia looks different in so many ways. I could maybe work with you and advocate on your behalf within a school, help push for um, better policy and better curriculum, or it may be an attorney that needs uh, to support you in your case. So uh, I would say reach out to CARE Michigan, C-A-I-R Michigan. Um, you can find us online, website, phone number. Um, but it, it's tricky. It depends on how it affects every person. Thank you very much for the information. Now we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, would like to hear from Huayda about her foreign policy agenda. When we come back. When you're looking for the best in optical care, Dr. Imad Nakash is your doctor to see. With years of experience and thousands of successful procedures performed, you can trust your eyes to Dr. Imad Nakash. See Dr. Imad Nakash and his professional staff for your eye care needs. There's two locations to serve you. In Hazel Park, call 248-336-3937. 248-336-3937. In Rochester Hills, call 248-299-3937. That's 248-299-3937. Are you going to start a restaurant or a grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? Call Naji Aboud at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Naji Aboud now, 734-744-9796. New concept products and design, the trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New concept products and design. New location, 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Naji Aboud, 734-744-9796. Are your hands feeling numb? Do you feel pain opening up a jar, turning a key? Are you noticing that your elbow and your shoulder are becoming stiff? Or were you recently injured in your arm? Hello, I'm Dr. Albanjit Katranji. And at the Katranji Hand Center, which just recently opened down the street from the Somerset Mall, we can provide you with the latest in hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder care. Visit us at www.katranjihandcenter.com to learn the latest techniques that we have to offer you. And I look forward to taking care of you. Visit us in Troy at 1565 West Big Beaver Road, Building F. Or call Katranji Hand Center for an appointment at 248-869-4263. That's 248-869-4263. Is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. I am Atif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are discussing um, Arab American women running for Congress. And this is the last segment of the program. 
And um, my question, Huayda, um, the, when, when I asked you why you are running for Congress, you talked about uh, how you would be looking for good paying jobs for your people, uh, becoming um, uh, a voice uh, for your Michigan people in Washington. You did touch on uh, hum human rights for Palestinians, but what else? I've been mainly speaking about issues that affect my local community because that is, these are the things that my constituents and voters here are concerned about mainly, things that affect their daily lives. You don't generally find members of a voting population, and specifically where I am in Michigan, uh, paying a whole lot of attention to what happens in foreign policy uh, U.S. foreign policy. So it's not something that I've been campaigning on, but as far as my or, or what my stance would be, what my position would be, there are a lot of different individual uh, issues, obviously, that I can comment on, but it comes back to one main principle in that we have to put human rights at the center of our policies. That includes foreign policy. I think once human rights are, we set that as our moral compass, anything else that we are doing as a country uh, internationally becomes a lot more clear. I have spent years and years of my life uh, on the ground in the occupied Palestinian territory. It saddens me, not only the brutality that I've seen there by Israeli state government and forces against the Palestinian people, but that my government, the United States, where I pay taxes, where my parents have paid taxes, and that is going to contribute to the oppression of people. And it's not only in Palestine where US foreign policy is not doing what we say we stand for as a country. I remember as a young girl being so proud of being an American. We stand for freedom and democracy and human rights and that is a beautiful thing. And it is only when I started growing up and paying a little bit more attention that I saw, wow, our policies are not supporting freedom and democracy and human rights in so many countries. And that was shocking that uh, changed the trajectory of what I did with my life. And I, I it set me up for you know, becoming a human rights attorney, staying an activist and campaigning member, uh, lobbying uh, you know, legislators to do what's right, to actually do what you say we stand for. And going back to you know, most voters in in this district probably don't pay a lot of attention. That is why this country is able to do what it does internationally, because we talk about freedom, human rights, and democracy, and most people are not paying attention to see that our policies overseas are not actually implementing that, and in many cases, unfortunately, are stymieing that. And so I will be an advocate for human rights. And it's not just in Palestine. When we're talking overseas, we heard obviously about Yemen in so many other places, in Bahrain, in Latin America, where a, the U.S. gets involved in a way that hinders freedom and human rights rather than uh, supports it. Only a couple of months ago, we saw a huge military aid package go to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia is we know what it's doing to the country of Yemen. And it's created the, you know, the largest humanitarian crisis uh, on the planet today. This is not something that if people here actually knew the details of that they would stand for. So in my uh, campaigning and everything that I do, again, centering human rights, while here I will focus on more domestic issues. When people know of my background and the work that I've done, they ask and I go back to saying, People everywhere inherently want the same thing. You know, we want uh, we want a, a life with freedom and dignity, whether that be in Yemen, Palestine, uh, Venezuela, or here in Macomb County. And that is always what we should keep in mind as we are uh, legislating as members of Congress or different levels of government. Uh, so you had a, a big question, but it all comes down to one uh, principle, and that is always center people's rights and human rights. Put that at the center of our foreign policy and we can't go wrong. What is the uh, most difficult challenge you have to overcome to win? Is it raising money, enough money? Is it the strength of competition from other um, candidates? 
Uh, is it bias and um, Arab phobia, for example? What, what is it exactly? Uh, thank you for that question. So far, the reception to my candidacy in, in, in the community in this district has been warm and, and wonderful. I have a very strong campaign team. We've launched a very strong campaign. But uh, as well as we're doing on the ground now, and we intend to increase and make the center of our uh, or, or the focus of our campaigning voter outreach, try to talk to every single person that we can. We know that when dark pack money comes in, when outside interest, the money of outside interest come in, they're going to have a lot of money to start attacking me by, for example, running commercials, which is very expensive. But if they are able to get on the airwaves with just one commercial, for example, saying Wade Araf supports terrorism or something like that, that we know our lies and only comes because of who we are and the principles that we hold, uh, that is, that's going to take a lot of money to challenge. And although I despise kind of fundraising and want to be out there more talking to people, I know that it is really important to make sure that my campaign has the resources that when those attacks start flying against me, we have the resources to fight back and make sure that our message is louder than the lies that are being perpetuated. So it, it does come down to money and money from outside groups that don't want the agenda and what I'm talking about to um, to win, don't want people like me who support uh, people's rights over, for example, uh, big corporations when we're talking domestically, or when I say Palestinians need to have human rights, or when I say that we should not be supporting war machines in other countries. There are big interests that don't want that and work against that. And how are they able to successfully work against that? They have a lot of money to do it. But I firmly believe that okay, we don't have the endless well of money that they might have, but we do have a lot of people power. And if we mobilize that correctly, we can stand up to it. And this is a, I, I am 100% confident that this is a seat that we can win. If everybody that is interested in someone, you know, something, what I stand for, if people want to see someone like me and what I stand for in power to get in touch with my campaign. And, you know, there's something that everyone can do and we all band together. I think we can defeat those uh, those with uh, endless resources to advocate the opposite. Okay, I, I'm not sure whether Adel Muzip uh, still with us or did he um, did a flight uh, uh, take off in the snowstorm, but it looks like he is not there. So Zainab, um, again, uh, from your experience, what would be the most difficult challenge for uh, an Arab American or Muslim American uh, candidate for any elected office? Well, I want to start by saying I feel like, uh, to clarify, we keep throwing around Arab and Muslim, and at times those are going to be two groups that don't align on all issues. If we look at the Arab community in the U.S., majority of, of people who came from Arab countries are Christian, and then if we look at the Muslim community, uh, majority of the Muslim community is not Arab, they're actually Black. Um, so I think we have to realign how we talk about Arab Americans and Muslims and not intertwine them. But I think for Muslims running for office, um, I think there's a few issues. What we just heard is the large Islamophobia network that's working against Muslims, uh, especially in the political arena, especially holding public office. Um, just a few weeks ago, I think CARE put out a report uh, highlighting uh, the Islamophobia Network, which is over two dozen organizations um, in just a few years who received over $100 million to do just that, to spread misinformation about Muslims, um, to perpetrate these stereotypes, to really hinder the ability for American Muslims to do their best to mobilize and grow, uh, et cetera. And, um, you know, that is a, a real, real hurdle for somebody running in public office. Um, there's another group, investiga Investigative Project for Terrorism. They're a nonprofit led by a very well-known anti-Muslim extremist, Steve Everson, um, who's been paying informants to spy on Muslim advocacy groups, to spy on elected officials such as Representative Keith Ellison, who was the first American Muslim to sit uh, and serve in the House of Representatives. So we know that there are these external forces 
And there's a number of reasons. They want to diminish our work. They want to make it seem like Islam is not even a religion, therefore it's not protected under the constitution, therefore we don't have the same rights. Um, we look at, you know, with the investigative project for terrorism, we saw ties directly to Israeli intelligence officials and their work in trying to diminish um, American Muslims and basically trying to make sure that okay. there is no Zainab. challenge. Zainab Fahas, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are running out of time. Thank you very much. I also thank, extend my thanks to candidate Huayda Araf and also thanks to Adel Muzib. Thank you all, and we'll see you again the first Friday next month. Have a good weekend.